the truth the girls. Hi everyone. The girls. Well, the question is, could this Ebola outbreak become a pandemic? And I'd like to give you a breakdown, which would basically include why or why not it could be a pandemic, and then I'll cover some paranoid scenarios uh, versus a, a more positive outlook. So first of all, the WHO has declared the Ebola epidemic a global health emergency. Well, this doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a pandemic, but they have to take this outbreak seriously because it's one of the deadliest diseases on the planet. It's a viral hemorrhagic fever. There's no vaccine. There's no cure. It can be up to 90% fatal, although in this epidemic it's been more like 60% fatal. There have been close to 1,000 people killed and about 1,800 cases so far. So far, also more than 100 health workers fighting Ebola have contracted it themselves. So here's why it could or could not become a pandemic. Um, first of all, why, why it could be, le it would be less likely because it has an incubation period of a two to 21 days, but it is not contagious until the person is symptomatic because it's contagious via bodily fluids like vomit, poop, and blood, uh, and uh, also in, in the sweat, uh, but it's not contagious by respiratory droplets. So it's not like the flu where, you know, if you're on a plane with someone who has it, you're going to get it just from the air. Uh, mostly people are getting it because they're in direct contact with the sick uh, or they're, they're bedding or it's something that's been contaminated with stuff like vomit and then they, they touch their face or they, they get it into their bodies because of poor hygiene. There is actually a patent on an Ebola virus out there. Well, it looks kind of suspicious. It's like, what did they do? Did they make the virus so they want to have an epidemic? Maybe they do want to have an epidemic. I'll get into that later. But did they make the Ebola virus? Here's a patent. Human Ebola virus species and compositions and methods thereof. Well, no, they didn't make the Ebola virus. What they did was they took some of this uh, Ebola Bundy Bugio virus because there are several strains of it. They took the Ebobun virus from a sufferer and isolated it, and they have a patent on that. And, and then they can use that for research, which could come in handy if there was something like an outbreak. So it's not the same thing as, you know, making the virus in the lab from scratch, like as if it was reverse engineered. I don't think that's what's happening here. And the guy, the first person on the list who owns the patent, Jonathan S. Towner, he's a virologist at the CDC. He works for the CDC, but in my mind, that doesn't exactly make him the government. Maybe I'm just missing something. Maybe I'm too trusting. I don't know. But I, I don't think that they made the virus and they're spreading it. So how is it spreading so quickly? Well, um, I think that the, the, the place where it's happening is a good setup for, for there to be this kind of an epidemic. How does Ebola virus spread and can it be stopped? Where, you know, they, they have to practice basic hygiene and isolate the patients. That, that, that's the bottom line. But the problem is um, Sierra Leone unable to contain Ebola outbreak. Because of a number of factors, they, they don't have the means to contain it. I mean, for one, they don't have the facilities, they don't have the manpower, the equipment. And second, the, the, the people who are getting it, mostly they're living in remote villages. They're very mistrustful of the health workers and the clinics. So in some cases, they actually think that they're bringing Ebola into the communities. And maybe part of this goes back to things like the contaminated vaccines, like in Nigeria, where the polio vaccine was found to be contaminated with HCG. And, and so, you know, yeah, they're, they're mistrustful. And so they'll actually stay home and then infect more relatives. Or in some cases, the relatives went into the clinics and forcibly removed their infected relatives and brought them back into the community. So, you know, this is really working against quarantine practices. Another thing that has contributed to these epidemics in the African countries um, has to do with the burial practices. The, the worst epidemic before this one was in Kitwit in 1995, and there were 317 people infected and 245 died. And part of this was because of the burial practices, which involved touching or even kissing the dead body. So the bodies are not disinfected, and then they're d doing this kind of burial where they're coming in contact directly with the fluids of an Ebola victim. So, you know, that really makes for um, a situation that would be very conducive to spreading this disease. That's not so likely to happen here. Could this scenario take place here in the West? 
I don't really think so. I think if it did, it would have to be because those in charge were you know, negligent or, or purposely letting it spread. I mean, if you want to go that way, consider in a, in a sort of paranoid way that maybe somebody would like to create an epidemic. Maybe there are people out there who would. I'm sure there are. Uh, if you'd like to consider that, then I guess it's possible that you know they could let it spread. But it's really not that contagious unless someone you know went into a lab and reverse engineered it to cross it with bird flu or to make it airborne or something and I've done videos on that before too whether is that a possibility I guess if it is a remote possibility I mean you there's two ways to look at this a very paranoid side you could say they're gonna use this to call the human population it may or may not have been created in a lab a future strain may or not may not be created in a lab they're not really gonna stem this epidemic we're all gonna die of Ebola you know, black death style, because they want us to, because Rockefeller Institute put out their document on the four scenarios for future technology and development, and one of them was lockstep, where we end up in a top-down, uh, total control, police state on a global scale, and it all starts with the pandemic, which was, in that case, not bird flu, but duck flu, and so they could use a pandemic to gain total control which I'm not even sure they have the in infrastructure to implement this at this point, but maybe they would like to. Uh, so, you know, there is that scenario. And does it have to be duck flu? Maybe it could be Ebola. I mean, I guess you could consider that. This was from uh, CBS. Ebola outbreak could be much worse than thought. Well, we all know that at this point. But um, what they mentioned here was the... the um, the two Americans, who, who the American missionaries who contracted Ebola and how they were brought back to the U.S. for treatment uh, with, a, with an experimental serum. And um, of course this could you know, raise alarm bells for some people like, well, they're bringing Ebola patients into the U.S., but they're bringing them on a medical plane that only takes one person, like one passenger at a time, and then they're put in strict isolation. So I think you know, that they're taking all the precautions. I mean, so far no one has gotten Ebola from them. But about this experimental serum, because they both received it and are doing well. It's from the Daily Beast, why the white Americans got the secret Ebola serum. Well, they talk here about some of the products they've been making to, to, to fight Ebola and why they had so little of it. They say that maybe they didn't expect to need it on a large scale. I mean, Ebola is very rare. There are other viruses like this too, you know. There are a whole bunch of them. Like there's Marburg, which is just, just as horrible. Um, so there was MV003, and then there's ZMAP. And I guess what they gave them now was, uh, was ZMAP. Uh, but does this have anything to do with race or anything like that? I don't think so. I, I think, you know, they're American citizens, so they brought them back, and they gave them the serum. I mean, they, I guess they could have taken a couple of Africans and brought them over and given them the serum, but they're not their citizens. And uh, I think they're experimenting. I think that that's what they're doing. They're, they're trying to see whether it works. And so they did their test on these two Americans to try to save their lives. You know, what's weird is that ZMAP is actually like a GMO product. It says ZMAP is made by inserting modified genes into the cells of tobacco plants, whose cells then become mini factories of the antibodies. So, you know, maybe there are, there are reasons also why they don't want to give this to everyone that maybe down the road the serum will be just as deadly as the disease or maybe more. I mean, who knows? They, I don't think they really have a solution to Ebola right now. They also said it would be kind of premature to rush ZMAP to the hot zone and observe that previous epidemics had been brought under control by effectively effective public health programs, which is true. And it's funny, I noticed right around the time that Ebola started becoming a hot topic in the news, um, there were also articles circulating about a plague outbreak. There was a case of plague in the U.S. Plague is back. I think it was actually a case of mnemonic plague. But um, plague is not uh, a, a gone from the U.S. I mean, you have plague. It's enzootic and marmots in the south. So you can get plague from a, from a marmot, like a, a gopher. And they, they have some cases every single year. And the most they had was, uh, well, in recent history, was they had... Uh, 40 cases in 1983, so 40 cases of bubonic plague in the USA, and yet, you know, there's no black death sweeping the nation. They also have it in India, and they also have had outbreaks even of pneumonic plague in China. And all this has always been controlled with quarantine and setting up clinics. I mean, the way that they've always done it, it, it works. And I think they could do this now, but they need help because 
like I said, they don't have the resources in those countries, so they need some help probably from the WHO, whoever else wants to go down there and risk their lives. But it's got to be done because otherwise it'll spread, maybe not all over the world, but probably to a, a lot of you know, villages in Africa. I don't have a lot of confidence in the WHO in handling something like this because look how they handled the swine flu. And also speaking of the swine flu, I remember that back when it was happening, I was kind of thinking that this was really more like just a drill for a real uh, pandemic of, of a more serious nature because it couldn't have been for the swine flu because that was nothing. Unless it was just to sell a lot of vaccines, which they did do, which maybe it was just that corporate agenda. But also at the time, there were a lot of rumors about uh, you know, these uh, coffins, coffin liners in a field in Georgia. What were they for? For the, for the Veterans Association? Well, we didn't believe that. And uh, digging mass graves in different places. So there is a possibility that, you know, that was a drill and that there will be a pandemic that will be engineered. That's kind of paranoid, but, you know, I'm just mentioning it because I guess it is a possibility. Or, you know, it could be that this is just real emergency and it'll be handled and it'll blow over and life will continue on as, as usual. Oh, and there have been a few cases outside. Terrifying, Ebola panic after passenger on Sierra Leone flight to London dies. It was a 72-year-old woman who was reportedly uh, sweating heavily and vomiting on the plane, and she died. Apparently, she didn't have Ebola, though. But a man who went from, I think it was Sierra Leone, to Saudi Arabia did die. He died of heart failure, but it turned out he did have Ebola. And now there's also, um, a person in Spain, a missionary, I think, uh, who may have Ebola, but they're going to be very carefully quarantined and isolated, you know, treated, so probably not everyone's going to get Ebola. I mean, look, if you go out and you see somebody barfing, you know, spewing vomit everywhere, maybe bleeding, I mean, if they look like they have Ebola, just stay away from them. And if somebody in your family looks like they have Ebola, man, you know, ca call the ambulance and tell them, like, I think somebody has Ebola in my family and, and get them to the hospital. But see, I know you will do that because you're not afraid to send them to the hospital. And if they die, you're not going to kiss their dead body. So unlikely that we're going to have this kind of epidemic and pandemic uh, here in North America. Well, the, that's what I think at this point, uh, but I'm keeping an eye on it. So let me know what you think. And thanks for listening to me, and I'll see you next time.